but it sometimes is easier to define them about what they are not. They're not strategic plans. It's not about what, I, what you can do. It's about the, what the context brings to you. They're not forecasts. You don't try to predict what's going to happen. And we don't call them as good or bad. There's no good or bad scenarios. They're just things that are going to come to us. So what are they? They are alternative plausible future. Remember, this is not about whether a future is probable, it's whether about a future is plausible. They imagine the critical uncertainties that we have today and how they will evolve in the future. They are written as narrative. They are like stories of the future. And as I said, they don't predict. They just ask, what if? So as you see, it's not, they don't describe a path from the present to the future. They describe different plausible path to alternative futures. Scenarios are not good for any situation. I mean, if, this, if the context is stable and it's not gonna change, you don't need to do scenarios. You need to do scenarios when you have what it's called tuna conditions, not the fish, but it's an acronym for turbulence, uncertainty, novelty, and ambivalence. If you think about our world today, I think we can check the four of them. That makes scenarios more relevant and more important. Again, they're not about the organization itself, but about the context. It's not things that are our, under our control, rather things that we can't control and that are coming to us from the context. In our situation, you know, each of us have their own foundation, organization, um, niche of a of a activity which is within the Jewish community, which is within the, uh, North, the uh, US context. We are asking things about the context. The scenarios describe the context and they affect the Jewish community as a whole and my organization in particular. Because it's based on uncertainty, the first question we ask when you start a scenario process is not what we know, but we, what we don't know. The idea is, to consider what is coming towards us from the future. Now, knowing that we don't know, uh, but trying to imagine things that, we may, that may be coming towards us from, from the future. When we have the scenarios, the idea is, again, the scenario is not a plan. It serves us as a wind tunnel to our plan. You know, in this, in this graphic, you see the classic wind tunnel, which is, uh, a place that mimics different weather conditions to see if the plane continues flying in different weather conditions. The same happens with the scenario. You're gonna take your strategy and you're gonna test it against the different scenarios to discover in which scenarios your plane cannot fly anymore. On what adjustments you need to do to your plan, to your plane, sorry, so that it can keep flying in different weather conditions. So again, the idea is you start from the present, you create plausible scenarios, and then you ask yourself the question, you go back and you say, what can I do today so that I can become more robust and more resilient in, the, uh, in each of the scenarios? What situations make me more fragile in each of the scenarios? What skills do I need? what uh, organizational architectures fare better in each of the scenarios. So oops, in summary, our scenarios are a set of imagined futures that are plausible. Again, we don't ask if they're probable, we ask if they're plausible. The scenarios are of the economic and social context of the United States. They are to be used by Jewish communal leaders, funders, and practitioners for the purpose of making sense of the context, inform our planning, wind tunnel our strategy, expand our, our thinking with the ultimate goal of being resilient and robust in different potential futures. I'm gonna uh, give it over now to Dina to explain a little bit the process that we did within JFN, which is a specific take on the scenario uh, design process. 
Thanks, Andres. Um, really glad to be here. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, I'm going to, like Andres said, just spend a few minutes talking about the process that we went through. But before I do that, I, I just wanted to share two personal thoughts or sort of observations or you know, aha moments that I had going through this. It was the first time I had been involved in a scenario development process before, and I actually found it amazing and exhilarating. Um, and in this environment, to have something amazing and exhilarating is, is very valuable. Um, so two things I just wanted to share. One is around mindset when you participate in this kind of work. I realized in the process that the best way to succeed or to make the most progress is to really come in with a stance of um, sort of suspension of a need for clarity and clear direction. Um, and you really need to be comfortable with ambiguity um, and sometimes even with contradiction. Um, and I just think going, you know, I think the video at the end is saying going in creative and open-minded. I think that's enormously important when we talk about doing this work. Um, and the second thing is I actually went in a bit, um, I went into this process a little skeptical. You know, here we have so much uncertainty and how is it possible that we're gonna come up with four futures? We don't even know what tomorrow looks like, but there are four futures and we have to plan for all of them. Like, how does that, how does that help? Um, and the, the real aha moment I had in the process as we were unpacking implications is we started to see that despite the difference of the scenarios, many of them shared the same implications and um, they shared a path forward. So whereas we don't really know what's gonna happen, we do know that if we take certain strategies, we're preparing ourselves better for a, a, a you know, multiple set of scenarios. And so that was actually, I found very comforting and that's where I think some of the exhilaration came in, like they can actually do something and take some control here. So there's just two things I think as you go into this that, that might just be helpful in framing. Okay, so let me tell you what we did. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen in a second and hopefully it will work seamlessly also. Um, we pulled together a group of about 15 people, um, JFN staff, board members, communal leaders, um, foundation professionals and funders. Um, we, uh, we used um, the facilitation of an expert scenario planner um, and we met together for four one-hour sessions. Again, as Andres mentioned, this is usually a much longer process and a much more in-depth and we really streamlined it. Um, so that was, um, that was sort of the, how, you know, the, who, who was doing the work. Um, we divided into two different groups um, and most of the work we actually stayed in our groups until uh, we got to a point where we sort of coalesced. So I'm, I'm gonna share my screen now and I'm actually gonna share with you the work that my group did. Okay, so. This is um, the, blank, the blank template that we started with. And as Andres explained earlier, um, here we have the sort of US context, right? Here is the Jewish community and here is the organization. And we spent our, our first few sessions just focusing on this, um, this context here. Um, and our group was tasked with populating it with um, all of the possible con contextual factors that we think might be affecting us. Um, and in, uh, within a half an hour, we were a really productive group. We came up with this. These are all stickies. Everybody was to use some of this great Zoom technology. Um, we, um, we populated with all these contextual factors. Um, just to give you some examples, um, more do-it-yourself everything, um, gender role shifts, um, staggering unemployment rates, um, more shared knowledge, um, intergenerational shifts. So we, we really tried to cover the gamut of all the contextual factors that, might, that may play a role. Um, then we categorized them and collapsed them into um, you know, tighter categories. Um, and here I just think it's interesting, we, we categorized them by um, economic, you can't really see, I'm sorry, but economic, political, social, um, technological, environmental, and um, legal contexts. Um, it's just interesting to note when you're doing this to see which voices you have at the table and which voices you may not have enough of. We didn't have too many environmentalists at the table, nor did we have too many lawyers, which I actually thought was interesting. Um, but this is how we, um, how we categorize it all. And then we were asked to identify which of our contextual factors had the most um, sort of, what were the most structural, structural in creating a thread through which we could build our scenarios, which had like the most the potential for greatest impact. And um, we, th at this point, our two groups came together and we um, you know, populated this. We thought that you know, some of these might be those right factors and ultimately we landed on the economy and social cohesion as our two, as our two um, factors. 
Um, and that is um, you know, how we started to build our scenarios. I just think it's important at this point just to say, we could have ended up with other um, factors um, and different polls. Um, and um, we just really wanted to be sure that we, we had um, you know, sort of a strong structure. I think it's important to also note that just because we picked one set of factors over another does not make those other factors any less important. Right, they actually became integral, and as we built out the scenarios, they became sort of the flesh on the bones of those of the two polls that we had picked. Um, I, I believe that JFNA is going through it has been working through a similar process in building scenarios, and they picked two different polls. They picked economy, like we did, um, and convening power to convene as their other poll. Um, in all honesty, part of our conversation was around using that uh, power to convene as one of our polls as well. But we ultimately thought that structurally, the social cohesion piece would probably get us further. Um, and I, to be honest, in light of the way the world has been unfolding over the last few weeks, we may, um, we may have made the right, the right choice there. Um, then, so that's where we are now. And then we take these two polls and, you know, we create the four quadrants that the video um, shared as well, right? So we have um, a new renaissance, right? So high social cohesion, high economy. Um, we have the smaller but tastier pie, which is high social cohesion but lower economy. Um, we have um, haves and have nots, which is high economy and lower social cohesion. And then the, the fourth quadrant would be what we call back to the 1930s, which is low social cohesion and, and low economy. Um, and then um, we started to get even more creative and our um, committee members um, started actually drafting narratives um, to match up to these quadrants. Um, and the way in which we did it was um, working backwards. So while the scenarios you'll see are all written in a chronological order with a beginning, middle, and an end, how they were conceived was actually in the reverse. Um, and we thought about what 2023 could look like and then how did we get there? I've heard this, um, this described as a history of the future and that's the process by which we, we went through. Um, so that is the, that's um, you know, how we develop the actual four scenarios. The next step, as, um, as the video explained and Andres um, referenced as well, was now the implications piece. Um, you know, what does this all mean for the Jewish community? If we remember those three circles, right, we had already now dealt with the larger context, contextual one, and now we're talking about the Jewish community one. Um, and so here at JFN, we took the liberty of taking that next step. And we built out what we imagined were the implications for the Jewish community for each of the scenarios. And when you look at them, um, you'll see we built into um, each of the scenarios uh, a set of implications for the community. I think now, um, you know, what we're hoping to do with all of you here is to think through the next, the next step, which is probably most critical for everyone, um, is what do, how do we take those scenarios and the implications for the Jewish community and think about what are the implications for particular sectors in the Jewish community and for organizations themselves. Um, and that's how we're gonna spend the rest of our time together. Um, I'm going to do it in two ways. The first, and Andres is going to lead this part of the conversation. The, the first is to share with you an exercise that we have gone through internally at JFN. We use the haves and have nots scenario, um, and we consider the implications on the Jewish philanthropic field. So that, um, Andres will actually show you the product of that work um, and explain to you how we got where we did. But then we're also going to do a fishbowl, um, sort of enact the experience. Um, we have some fish who we've... <laughs> Caught, who said they were willing to participate in this. Um, and um, again, it's an experiment. So hopefully it will all work really well. But um, it'll be, it's always best to see it in practice so that you can um, think about doing it yourselves. Um, and so before we get there, we are going to pause for five minutes. Um, Tamar is going to share in the chat, which she did right now, um, the scenario, which is the haves and have nots, which is the high economy, low social cohesion. Um, we'd like you to spend about five minutes reading it just so that you're prepared or that you have a good sense of what we're going to be talking about. Um, before we get there, I just want to say two quick things about the scenario. One, we wrote it in the end of April, beginning of May, which I just think is important to know. Um, and the second is that it may be difficult to read. Um, it is, um, you know, along the lines of what I said in the, my opening, in that there is something actually cathartic or comforting about doing this work because there is so much uncertainty. We felt it was important to share this one because some of this process could help sort of get, get us through the scenario. Um, and I hope you'll find that to be the case. Um, so if you can just use the next five minutes to please read through it. Um, all right, thanks everybody. Um, we'll see you in a few minutes. The scenario is 
one in which the, the economy recovers pretty fast um, and it gets to a point in which is even better than 2019. Uh, but the but the economic recovery accentuates social division and and social polarization. This is a world in which um, the president gets reelected thanks to that uh, economic recovery, and the social tensions rise. Uh, there is a a world in which the the uh, income inequality grows, and with that. Uh, there are uh, many uh, many tensions that get played out in the society, like the ones we saw this week. There's uh, racism. There's mainstream anti-Semitism. Uh, there's this is a world of gated communities for the rich and um, urban decay and and rioting for the for the poor. A world in which the Jews get caught in the middle and um, and um, this is a this is a world in which, for example, family becomes very important because people uh, it's an unsafe world, so people revert to their families. It's also a world in which young people become increasingly radicalized, and and the outside society is perceived as risky and hostile. Okay, so thank you for, for, for reading. I know it's not a very uplifting uh, read, so <laughs> apologies for that. But the truth is that, as we said at the beginning, even that quote-unquote bad scenario, or one that makes us feel afraid or threatened, is a scenario that could have opportunities for us. Uh, remember, the idea is not to judge the scenarios, but to try to find out what the implications are for us and what do we need to do to thrive in that scenario? We're going to show you the, the work we, we did uh, with JFN after developing the scenarios, which was talking about the implications that the scenarios have for different community systems. You know, the community as a whole, it's, it's very hard to talk about implications for the community because the community is really different sectors. There is young adults, there is day schools, there is camps, there is Jewish philanthropy, there is human services, there is welfare organizations, etc. So within JFN, we we ask ourselves, so in these scenarios, have and have not, and we you should do this for all the four scenarios. What are the implications for the field of Jewish philanthropy, which is the why the one in which we work? And we came up with some. Um, so for example, as you see here, uh, there is more wealth accumulation, so there could be a growth in philanthropy. Now on the other hand, there is a shift to human services. So many other uh, areas of, of communal work may suffer because of the poverty. Many funders maybe, uh, they feel the need to go, to go there. Uh, there's a polarization of giving. Right, they have and have not. So the haves can give more, but young funders and those in the middle levels uh, can give less, because uh, the the safety nets of the of the government is not uh, very good. There is a a, um, a, a, a you know we're, we're we're relying on philanthropy more and more to solve social problems. Um, there is a question about the uh, democracy of, of philanthropy in the community. There is, in a context of high polarization, it's very hard to find real data and fake news becomes mainstream. Um, professionals working in philanthropy are sandwiched because on the one hand they represent the haves, but on the other hand they themselves may be part of the have-nots, so they work with the have-nots in their nonprofit. Um, so then we ask ourselves, okay, what are the opportunities for us in this, in this scenario? So there is, there is, for example, a growth in philanthropy in this scenario. Um, there is uh, a role that philanthropy can play uh, in addressing social issues. Uh, there are threats in this scenario, and you can read them there. Uh, so for example, 
there's going to be a, a decrease in the social value of philanthropy because people are going to be upset with the haves. So philanthropy may suffer because of that. Um, there will be more, the, the philanthropy may become more insular, more focused on your own local community and national causes may, may suffer. Then we ask ourselves, okay, to, to thrive in these scenarios, we need to learn some things. We need to learn how to work differently, right? So we ask ourselves, what are the skills and competencies that we need to operate in this, in this scenario? You know, one of the things that we, that we thought is, this is a scenario in which federations and foundations work together, will need to work together a lot. So do we have that skill as a philanthropic field? Right? And then finally, we ask ourselves, what can we do today to prepare? Right? So for example, we said, you know, we need a, if, if we think that there's going to be a problem in networking, um, we need to double down on work on coalitions and, 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 and peer networks. We need to um, sort of start training on the skills that we will need in the, in the future. So this is an example of the work we did. In our site, you're gonna have another example that's something we did with young adults. But what we wanted to do now was to actually do this exercise live. We have, as Dina said, we have uh, four people here that are volunteered to be our guinea pigs in this, in this process. We have Hindi Pupko from uh, UJA in New York. We have um, Jim Heger, who is the chair of the uh, Fe uh, Jewish Federation of San Francisco, Stephanie Rhodes, uh, the CEO of Slingshot, all dear friends of the Antamar Friedman, of course, uh, our own, uh, all of them dear friends of Jeff N and of mine personally. And what we're going to ask them is the following. We're going to we're going to say, let's take the field of young adults, which is a field that all of them are familiar with. You know, Jim was the chair of uh, Moshe House and Hindi worked with that and Stephanie works in, in Slingshot, so she knows the field. So, and let's ask the same questions about uh, these particular sections. So, what are the implications of the have and have not scenario for the community work with young adults. Who wants to volunteer the first one? I'm happy to start. Yes. Hi, Hi everyone. Thanks for including me. I mean, I don't know about other people, but as I was watching the videos, my heart rate would sort of go up or go down depending on what <laughs> uh, you were showing on, on screen. I don't know about others, but I actually think this scenario, have and have nots, not that we're making predictions, but it seems very likely in a lot of ways. I don't know if others felt that way as well. And I think for young adults, um, it's gonna be really challenging. And I think in many ways, what's happening on the streets today is playing some of this out, right? So right now you have teens, really young adults, right? I used to think I'm a young adult, I am not. Like I'm talking 18, 19, 20. These are the people on the streets and the, the crisis that I think many of them are facing knowingly or not is that they are engaged in a life-changing, powerful moment. And it's not necessarily happening in a Jewish container or in a Jewish community for many of them. And I don't know that many of them have a Jewish community that they are walking in the streets with, as opposed to just you know um, coalitions that they've sort of sporadically, intentionally, really, or, or, or not really have joined, but are sort of... Um, aspirationally joining them. And if we miss the moment now and in this future to say, actually, you don't need to choose what side you're on, the haves or have nots. And the Jewish community is here. There is a role for the Jewish community to play in closing that inequality gap. And whether we're talking about policing, you talk about anti-Semitism being up in haves and have nots. So what does it look like when young adults are faced with two contradictory needs, on the one hand, protecting their own in the face of anti-Semitism, and on the other hand, being keenly aware of the impact of policing on some communities that continue to rally on the streets. So I think th those implications are great, and we're not up to this part yet, but I think we need to be thinking now, 
how to create a Jewish container for that movement, call it the movement to close the income gap. For, because if we don't, they will view the Jewish community as being complicit in the haves and haves nots and not part of the solution to close the gap. Right, so there's an opportunity, there, there, there are some uh, implications, but there's already an opportunity there. I mean, a community could play a role in closing that gap and by that addressing a social issue, but also right. providing a home for the, for the for young Jews. That's just yes. one piece to share. Yeah, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, this is a yeah, free I think, I think one of the other one of the other implications I think is is with this have and have not scenario is um, the 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 challenge that's going to create or the the tension is going to create for young adults around you know their future and the, and the prospects for the future and the, and the you know it 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 it, it creates a um, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, lots of uncertainty, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, concern about, you know, uh, the, their careers, um, the, the, you know, the opportunities that they're going to have for the future. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we've been talking about whether that, you know, there's already, as they've come up through, you know, the college age, you know, programming, there's already been a, a ton of work done on the mental health of, um, of uh, you know, of young adults in the Jewish community. And I think this is going to be a big issue, um, you know, that, that we're going to have to tackle, uh, you know, as we go forward with young adults. And, and as particularly with, you know, as, as Gen Z, you know, sort of becomes the cohort of, of young young adults, it's going to be a big issue for us. So, and, and I think it's, I think, it, you know, as, as many you know, people have talked, you know, of late that this crisis is is accelerating some of these trends that we saw before. So it's not new, but it's but it's going to make it worse. Yeah. So, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm thinking, um, I would imagine in this scenario that what we would see is activated young adults, right? Like um, the distrust in leadership, particularly government leadership, which would open uh, the possibilities of um, more of these young folks running for office in whatever way they can, given the limitations of, of this. Um, it also occurred to me when I was reading this that, that there could be potentially even um, young folks trying to, to help move um, resources right to the, to the underserved, people who were friends and family members before this. And I'm thinking a lot actually also about um, how intersectionality fits in all of this. What happens to the young um, adults in our community who are children of intermarried families, interfaith, um, Jews of color, um, and also, uh, you know, if there's no travel, if we're, if we're closer, how are we, how are these um, how are these folks connecting to Israel, which, you know, if you're not going there, I, I know it, it was in there, but I'm thinking a lot about that with, with, um, yeah. And on college I mean, this is, Yeah, this is, this is a threat. So many, for much of the organizations that we have that are based on Israel, much of our Israel <coughs> engagement work rather is based on travel. So how do we operate in a context in which there's no, there's no travel. I, I think I build off that, that idea on the travel. Um, it's interesting. One of the things I think Moisha House has seen in the last couple of months is um, the uh, a program that that is typically hyper local, where you are bringing together your network of of uh, social contacts in your residence to you know to do programming um, had, by virtue of it going. Uh, by virtue of going by 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 going virtual, um, it has opened up opportunities for global uh, discussions that didn't that hadn't hadn't happened before in the Moisture House context, and so it, it it's it's while while there's while not traveling is 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 going to be an issue, uh, you know, for certain programs. There's others where I think it's going to enhance our ability to you know, bring different kinds of groups and different networks together than maybe we've had in the past. I also wonder if you're going to see a lot of young adults living at home mm -hmm. because of economic reasons and what's happening in the cities. 
And what does that mean for groups like One Table or Moisha House that are based on the assumption that young adults are going to be living alone and with roommates and with their own demographics? So you're going to see a lot of young adults in sort of the proverbial, you know, basement or their childhood homes. And that will have um, huge ramifications on the way in which we seek to find them, engage them, connect them and build community. Um, and on the other hand, I bet you'll also see some young adults who say, I'm not leaving the city, right? I consider myself among them or sort of say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going down with the city, you know, no one's taking me to the suburbs. And you'll see that, that group. And yet you'll also see, I think, Jewish resources migrating from an urban setting to a suburban setting, if that's where the money and people are going. So then what does that mean for the young Jewish adults that have remained in an urban setting, and yet those incredible urban-based Jewish communities and resources that we've spent so long sort of building, what happens to them? And I think, um, you know, from an opportunistic perspective right now, um, one might think about what it looks like to invest in the suburbs in a different way simultaneously alongside you know the urban communities that we've been heavily invested in and um to try to bring some equality there so you also don't have young adults now in the basement with no moisture house and no on um, one table and none of that you want to make sure that's there but not but trying to do the urban and suburban thing more equally at the same time yeah. i also wonder Hindi, sorry what uh, Tamara, you wanted to say something. Yeah, so thank you. And I want to echo so much of what all of you have said. And I just, to piggyback a little bit on what Hindi was saying, and is what about the space that we create on campus and how much and resources and energy that we take um, in the community to work with, with the different campuses and maybe more will be commuter schools and how do we want to continue to engage students in, in, in an impactful and helpful way for them. So, so basically, the notion that we base much of our young adult engagement today on campus, but in this scenario, less people go to campus. And Hindi, you can you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it, this is already happening with the growth of commuter schools and community college in New York City. I think yeah. it's thirteen or fourteen thousand Jews study in the in the CUNY system in New York. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, sorry. We, I, I, no, no, it just what actually what Tamar and Hindi both said occurs to me. What happens? How do, how do they date? How do they find each other? And do the, does the sort of closing in of the walls of the community move us to a place where there's actually less intermarriage, more uh, marrying people we know we grew up with? Or does that mean that they're actually waiting longer because we have to wait till we get to the other side of this for people to get out and start meeting each other again um is there more online dating i'm not sure how that would work That's but maybe there's an opportunity there yeah. excellent so and, and any... sorry that would also mean kids right sorry it would just push yeah. off or change what that means about the next generation of people that we're bringing into the world too we, we may Sorry, have the opposite. No, we may have the opposite of a baby boom in, in the 2020s. Now, okay. Now, remember, we're not trying to really do this exercise for real. We're trying to show how it works. But you get the idea here that um, we try to see how, how many, of our, many of our assumptions changed in this scenario. And then we try to identify, you know, there are opportunities here and there are things we could do. Um, and there are also threats. The question is then, and we, we're going to do this in just two more minutes so that we leave time um, to close and if there are some questions that we can address. One, once that, I, that you populated all this chart, um, how do you think of the things that you need to do today, that you can start doing today to prepare? So. Anybody wants to offer a couple of ideas of things to do uh, today? Yeah, I, so, so one thing I think, you know, that... By, that by the way, just sorry, one, one second, yeah. Jim. Uh, yeah. The skills and competencies are... We're going to mix the two, right? If, yeah. it's, if yeah. what you need to do is to develop a skill, we, we can put it here yeah. too. Okay. So, so, so I wanted to talk about the skills. And, and, and one of the skills that I think we need to be thinking about is, is as we are bringing people into our organizations, thinking about people who have experience moving an organization through change, through significant change. Change management is gonna become a critical uh, a tool 
uh, for us to, you know, for us as organizations to be able to, uh, to, you know, to master. And so I think as we're, as we're, you know, as part of the consideration of who we're bringing on in our organizations, that has to be a, a critical, critical element. And we need to be developing those skills in the, in the folks in the, in each of the organizations already. So I think that's one of the ones that we, we've already been talking about at a couple of organizations that I'm involved in. I would say some of the other things that we should consider, let's assume for a second that um, young adults also include um, young adults who are married with young children. And I think for, for many of those, I'll speak you know, personally, my mom has essentially become, and we joke about it, the primary caregiver for our one-year-old. I, I'm like, what is he eating these days? When the time does he go to sleep? I have, I have no idea because she's basically raising him. And you know, if you have more young adults living at home, the grandparents are going to be playing an outsized role in the Jewish education, continuity, um, identity of those children. So what can we do now to build on the efforts that we've started to engage grandparents in um, being sort of key elements of Jewish identity fostering for their grandchildren? So I think that's A, we've already started that work. Let's build on it. It's a great opportunity. We spoke about investing in the suburbs. I know that's important for New York. Like how could we um, throw new talent, new energy? I love the suburbs, but there's certainly more that we could be doing um, to ensure that the suburbs are just as vibrant Jewishly as the city is thought of as being. And I also think there's a lot of work that we have to do now with teens who will be those young adults or in some ways are those young adults. And how can we capture the enthusiasm um, and grit of those teens on the streets today and say, we want you, you're part of us. And here's what it means to be Jewish in this moment and to do that work through a Jewish lens. Excellent. Okay, this is, this is great. Stephanie, any things? The only other thing I would add is this for me um, really actually in this scenario, I feel like we had better um, show up and create partnerships for other um, minority communities. Like if this is what is coming at us, partnerships with um, you know, the black community, with um, other religious, like the more, the stronger those bonds could be going into this scenario um, I have to believe that's the better, and I would be remiss not to also say that I think it's a great case for um, making sure that we're involving young people in leadership as we start to imagine what the future of Jewish life will look like or could look like. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you all. So this is this is how the process looks like now. You can do this for your organization. So for example, at JFN, we said, what are the implications for the field of philanthropy? But then what opportunities are there for JFN specifically, right? For Moishe House, for UJA, for whatever your organization is. And then here you start having a list of things that you can do now. Now, the beauty of this is when you come, when you, when you start looking at this list, you're going to realize that in several of the scenarios, the things that you have to do are the same, right? In all of the scenarios, I would assume that there's gonna be a change in, this, in, the, in the, the different models of, of socialization. In any of the scenarios, there will be a need for change management. So it's not so daunting when you see that many of the things that you can do now are actually good in several of the, of the scenarios. Um, Thank you guys so much for being our, our guinea pigs here. And also you gave really good ideas of things that we can do uh, now. Um, I'm going to give it back to Dina now for, uh, for a minute to close and also offer a few ideas of how you can engage with this. Thank you. Um, I, I just, I really need Stephanie, Hindi, Jim, Tamar. That was way better than we could even have imagined. So thank you. It was incredibly productive. So um, it's fabulous. Um, so and I just wanted to share, um, one thing I just wanted to sort of share what we're planning to do now with the scenarios. Um, and then I'm actually going to ask for everyone to uh, indulge us for a favor. Uh, but let's talk first about what our next steps are. 
Um, so we really think that this, this work is an incredibly helpful tool um, for organizations, for funders, for planners, um, for colleagues to be working together. And so everything on our website, um, which we will try to be sure is secure, um, is available for use. Um, it's, the, it's yours, it's the communities. It was, it was meant, built and meant for the community. Um, if there is any interest in going deeper, whether it's in facilitation training or it's in um, working with the existing scenarios or it's in creating new scenarios, please be in touch with us. We're, we're happy to think about best ways that we might be able to work together um, in, those, um, in those contexts. And with our membership for all JFN members, we are hoping to use these scenarios in some of our peer networks or our affinity groups and taking this work um, a, deeper with um, you know, funders with shared, uh, with shared goals and shared interests. So um, you know, please reach out if there's anything we can do and please go through the website and take whatever it is that you need. Um, it's, it's, it's for the community. Thank you all.